All right, it looks like we've got a critical mass of people on the line. So welcome everyone. I'm gonna hand it over to Stephen Jobin, the chapter president of Cornet New England to get us started. Thank you, Kate. Thank you everyone for carving out some time of your busy morning and spending it with your Cornet family. For those of you that do not recognize my voice, my name is Stephen Dobin, and on April 1st, I humbly became your chapter's president. I hope everyone is practicing social distancing and are doing well. When this pandemic is over, I know our chapter is planning a celebration as Suzanne Cooper communicated during last week's virtual annual meeting, and there'll be more to come on this future date. As this pandemic event started taking shape, your executive committee made the forward thinking decision to continue our strong educational mission and created CRAVE, Cornet Real Advantage Virtual Education Series, supporting our members' desire for continued learning. CRAVE is a virtual roundtable uh, discussing important, timely, relevant topics in corporate real estate. Topics that may be explored, remote working, morale management, policies providing a safe work environment, supply chain logistics, changes to workplaces that are not locked down, construction and legal implications, ergonomic technology for a home office setup, which are, these are just, just some of the topics under consideration. Next Tuesday, April 14th at 12, Jan Johnson, Allsteel's lead workplace strategist and social innovator, Researcher and author Jeff Littner will host a webinar for our members and sponsors. This webinar is titled Unwritten Rules, How Workplaces Really Work in an Era of Social Distancing. Please register through our Monday morning newsletter or our website if you would like to join us. But also, if there's a topic that interests you that you would like to address as part of this Crave series, please forward your suggestion to Trish Fields, our executive director. I would like to take this opportunity and welcome all of you to our first CRAVE webinar. CBRE Chairman of America's Research and Chief Economic Advisor, Spencer Levy, will provide a timely presentation on the economic impacts of COVID-19 to the world, the United States, Massachusetts, and the corporate real estate industry. But before I turn over to Corporate New England Board Member and CBRE, Senior Managing Director Monica Wan to introduce Spencer. I want to quickly go over a couple of housekeeping items, all for your, uh, excuse me, a couple of housekeeping items. All of your lines will be muted throughout this webinar. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom webinar panel. Additionally, if Zoom webinar should experience an outage during the webinar, you will immediately receive an email from our team with an alternate login to rejoin the webinar via Ring Central. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Monica Wan to introduce Spencer. Monica, please take it away. Thank you, Stephen. Spencer Levy is the Chairman of America's Research and Senior Economic Advisor for CBRE. He's regularly quoted in major business publications and is a frequent guest on Bloomberg, Bloomberg CNBC, PBS, and Fox Business. By leveraging his 23 years of experience in commercial real estate, including the past 11 at CBRE, Spencer has redefined the role of research leader. Spencer combines his experience as a lawyer, investment banker, and capital markets leader that touches on all aspects of commercial real estate. Spencer regularly speaks at major events of the country's leading commercial real estate organizations, including Cornet, NAOP, ULI, ICSE, and CREW. He also has, has guest lectured at major universities, including his alma maters, Harvard and Cornell, in addition to Columbia, NYU, John Hopkins, Indiana, Georgetown, Pitt, Auburn, and many others. Spencer is a recipient of multiple industry awards, including the Cornet Luminary Award for Excellence in Public Speaking. While a New Yorker for most of his life, Spencer currently lives in Baltimore and is a proud husband of 19 years and a father of three children. He sits on the board of Baltimore's Leadership School for Young Women and Harvard Alumni Real Estate. Spencer, I'm a big fan, and you know that there are many others who are eager to hear your, your perspective. So I'll turn this session over to you. Thank well, you. Well, thank you, Monica. And I'm a big fan of, of yours and Cornet and uh, many of my friends here on the phone today. And um, 
so let's begin. And what I would love to do today is talk about what's happening in the big picture and really try to bring it down to the small picture of uh, the smaller picture, the micro of not only what it means to real estate, but I'll try to have a, a special emphasis on what it means for corporate real estate. And I'll speak for about 20 minutes and then I would ask you to ask any and all questions. Uh, try to put your questions into the chat room. It's probably the easiest way to get them to me, but all questions, welcome. So to begin, we all know where we are and where we are is where I am is in my home. And I'm in my home speaking to you because uh, we have not just social distancing, but we have a mandate from the state of Maryland that uh, we shouldn't leave our homes except for essential needs. And we expect this to continue at least for the next two months. And I say at least for the next two months, I say that's probably the outside two months of the maximum social distancing. And then after that, we expect a gradual ratcheting down of that uh, as testing becomes more available. So let me begin with our macro forecast. And we really have three forecasts. We have a forecast for the economy. We have a forecast for the virus. And then we have a forecast for what this means for commercial real estate. And they're, and they're different. And so the economy forecast is that the second quarter is going to be perhaps the most challenging quarter in American history. Our GDP forecast is for negative GDP in second quarter down about 20%. And there are others on Wall Street that are much more bearish than that. Uh, Morgan Stanley is around 30% negative. Goldman Sachs came out yesterday at negative 34. And there are also different negative forecasts for the level and depth of the unemployment rise. Uh, we are believing that it's going to more than double to over 6%. There are others that are much more bearish than that that think it's going to be over 10%. And I know there's significant risk on our forecast on the downside, meaning a much higher unemployment loss than we have previously forecast. Now, the double bad news about the unemployment is that it's hitting the most vulnerable people in our uh, country, people that are service workers, typically at the lower end of the economic spectrum, and uh, the people who can least afford to lose their jobs are losing their jobs. That's the bad news. The good news is what our forecast is for after the doors begin to open, after we begin to recover, because our house view is for a V-shaped recovery, and the V-shaped recovery meaning that we are going to have this rapid downfall followed by a fairly rapid rise again, starting in late third quarter into the fourth and into 2021, where we're likely to see double digit GDP in the third and fourth quarter and over 5% in 2021, and a rapid bounce back of many of these jobs that are lost. Now we're not gonna gain back all the jobs and then we're not gonna get back to par again in jobs probably for about two years. But I guess the good news of that, at least in our forecast, is that it would be faster then we bounce back uh, from other comparable time periods, most notably the global financial crisis. Now, let me be clear about what I do and what I'm looking at. I am looking at comps, just like every good real estate professional is on asset purchases or lease, uh, leases that they're looking to sign. And the comps I'm looking at aren't just the global financial crisis, the comps aren't, uh, or 9-11. I'm also looking outside the United States at comps that I think might be relevant to try to predict the economic and real estate outcomes that were going to come in front of us. And so the other comps I'm looking at are the results of SARS in 2003 in Asia, what's happening in China today in their midst of their COVID-19 crisis. I'm looking at the Japanese tsunami and how they recovered. I'm looking at Hurricane Sandy in New York. I'm looking at the LA port strike in 2014-15. I can go on, there are more comps than that. But ultimately, we're trying to find a way to predict the future with such an uncertain event. But nevertheless, we're using all these different comps together, we have reached this economic V-shaped recovery. Now others are more pessimistic. I was just on the phone with a major German investor. They have a U-shaped recovery, and there are others that have that as well. And it really comes down to how quickly small businesses can bounce back. Not large businesses, because I would say that if you take a look at the best comp we have for people that are at the later stages of the crisis, uh, which is China, you will see that their big businesses have almost totally bounced back. It is the small businesses which are lagging, and it is from the consumer side what is lagging are large purchases. 
we have seen a significant bounce back in the purchase of consumables. Just to give you a recognizable example, as of a month ago, basically every Starbucks store in China was closed. Today, 90% of them are open. And we have this thing, if there's any room for comedy in a tragedy like this, my colleague Henry Chin, who's over in Hong Kong, coined a new term. He called it revenge retail. And what that means is what he's seeing on the ground in Hong Kong right now is queues of people lining up to get into luxury stores and to restaurants to buy stuff and to eat and be in a place with other people because people are have pent up demand for goods. So that I think is a sign of optimism, what's happening there, which could be applied here, which gives me optimism that we can come out of this faster. Now I have received significant uh, pushback on the China comp. Is all the information coming out of there accurate? Have they bounced back as quickly as we think? These are all fair criticisms, but there are no perfect comps and we're looking at all of them. So what does this mean for commercial real estate? What we're seeing right now is probably the most important 45 to 60 day period in the history of our industry. And why do I say that? Because most of what I do, and for those of you on this call who have seen me speak before, I generally speak about the big picture mega trends and how they will impact our industry over the longer term. I've had to understand how our industry is going to be impacted on an almost day by day basis, because in the next 45 to 60 days, we're going to see who's going to be paying their rent and we're going to see who's paying their mortgages. And right now the evidence that's coming in is all over the map. I will tell you, I was on the phone yesterday with a large international company and they said that their office collections in Europe, which they've already collected April, they collected about 90% of their rent. Not great, not bad, but they also have a retail portfolio over in Europe and they've only collected 20% of their rents. It is going to be that wide band of rent collections that's going to determine the course of landlord tenant relationships and the course of relationships with mortgage lenders over the next 60 to 90 days. Now, there is some good news out there, and I think the good news was led by our government sponsored uh, entities, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who a couple of weeks ago came out with guidance that they were going to give complete mortgage forbearance for a 90 day period in exchange for no evictions during that period of time for renters. And we've seen many people uh, take advantage of that. We, a CBRE, is a very large servicer for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, so I have firsthand knowledge of a lot of people applying for these, but not everybody, in fact, not even close to a majority, many, but certainly not all. At the same time, there has been a spillover effect of what renters are doing, as we're seeing in many cities, even renters who are not in distress, renters who are able to work from home, who are employed, uh, many of them are not paying rent. But of course, there are many people who can't pay rent, and those are typically people in the workforce housing area. And in those folks, uh, that is really what the target was of Fannie and Freddie. And uh, we expect that distress, that lack of rent payment to last uh, for about 90 days. Now, if we go into the other asset classes, we start uh, with retail and hotels, the two asset classes that have been by far the hardest hit, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, rent collections in Europe, about 20% of retail. And I, I, I look to my right while I'm standing here because I have a screen which shows the feed from my retail group, my debt and structured finance group, my other groups and saying, who's not paying their rent now? And we get announcements every day of major national retailers uh, deciding not to pay their rent uh, for the month of April. So it's a very concerning situation, uh, certainly in the short term, but regrettably, it might be longer term because when you take a look at the retailers in America, a disproportionate number of them have loans, not from Fannie and Freddie. Well, none of them do from Fannie and Freddie. Some of them do from banks, some from insurance companies, but a disproportionate number of them have loans from conduit CMBS lenders. And the tragedy of that, and maybe tragedy is too strong a word for just an economic thing, but the tragedy of it from their perspective is that those lenders are the least flexible. So you are seeing situations, and again, on the same screen to my right, uh, distressed retail landlords who want to negotiate with their conduit lenders, and the conduit lenders are suggesting to them, uh, some of them are suggesting they need to default on their loans before they'll negotiate. So we're expecting a very, very difficult situation in retail, not only in the short term, but lasting longer term as these workouts with their conduit lenders uh, are going to accelerate, rent payments are going to be uh, uh, withheld, and uh, uh, yet another 
uh, piece of negative news. Uh, I was on call with my restaurant group last week, and they believe that up to 20% of restaurants will never come back. So that is a tough pill to swallow. I guess the uh, silver lining within retail is in the restaurant, excuse me, in the uh, grocery store and pharmaceutical space today, which are having record sales. To give you one comp, there's a large grocer out of Texas, HEB, that was typically doing about a million dollars a week out of the store. They're now doing a million dollars a day. And so there is some strength in retail in the areas that historically have been strong, grocery anchored retail. Industrial is an area that is likely to be a net beneficiary in the short and long term because of what's happening today. Uh, in the short term, we've obviously seen supply chain stretched to the point of breaking across many product types. And what this has shown is that our supply chains are not resilient. That's the key word. When I talk with the folks on uh, about the environment, we always talk about two words. We talk about sustainability on the one hand and resilience on the other. Sustainability is has to do with energy efficiency, water usage. It does not have to do with resilience. And resilience is key uh, to a supply chain because as we saw when there were concerns over groceries, they couldn't get to the market fast enough. There was runs on grocery stores. We even saw some large occupiers like Apple saying they had their supply lines uh, impaired. Uh, from China. So what you're likely to see, number one, is you're likely to see an acceleration of a trend that I've already predicted uh, in many forms, including, I'm sure, in Cornet and Boston, when I talked about how more manufacturing is going to come back to the United States because of cheaper automation, because of protectionism. But now this resilience thing is going to be asked about on every call for every public company uh, going forward. And just be prepared for it. You're going to have more industrial demand for manufacturing here, but you're also going to have more industrial demand for storage of critical goods. And why is that? Because we've become so efficient, and everybody on this call knows one of my bugaboos, as I always debate the difference between efficiency and productivity. We've become so efficient that everybody thinks that just-in-time delivery or just-in-time storage is the better way to go. Well, that wasn't correct. It might have been correct from a financial point of view until we had a crisis and then the resilience factor came up, which means greater demand for industrial for manufacturing, greater demand for industrial from storage of goods, greater demand for last mile as there have been some behavioral changes as it relates to delivery of food to the homes in particular. And the question is, will they be durable? We don't know how durable they'll be, but they certainly have accelerated whatever trends we had towards home delivery of things like food, which was actually a laggard behind other categories. So industrial net beneficiary, and I'll give you one other factor on industrial. We're looking at industrial values globally, and I just received a study yesterday from my good friend and colleague, Henry Chin in Hong Kong, the same guy who coined the term revenge retail, and he did a survey of what's going to happen to the value of real estate in Asia across all the asset types post COVID-19. And the punchline is that he believes that cap rates are going to increase by 50 to 75 basis points. But the one area that showed almost no increase, except there were a couple of increases in Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore, was logistics, industrial. Industrial values were largely maintained in Asia post-crisis, while the other asset classes uh, bore the brunt of the fall off in uh, fundamental value. Let's now talk about office, because I think that's the area that most of you spend the most time on and what we see happening there. Well, I guess the good news in office in the short term is what I mentioned uh, earlier, that we're seeing a much higher level of rent collection there than perhaps any other asset type with the possible exception of big box warehouse industrial. We are seeing some fall off in industrial rent collections in small bay warehouse because some so smaller contractors are suffering. But overall, industrial and office are showing a tremendous amount of rent collection today, which, which is almost a funny thing to say on this call, but, it's the, but you have to talk about what's happening. And we monitor this. We manage, CBRE manages, I believe, 7,700 properties in the United States. And we're watching this on a daily basis. And I was just on a call with my global COO, uh, Gil, Gray, Grayson Gill, a moment ago, talking about this very issue. So we're on this. Uh, and the good news is most collections are coming in. And we are strongly recommending to our uh, tenant clients, many of whom occupier clients are on the call today, if you can pay your rent, pay your rent. Because ultimately, um, there are a lot of people who can't, and we think that the best way forward is to move forward as normally as possible. But nevertheless, what we see happening in office is the following. 
in the short term, almost all leasing has paused. Hasn't stopped, it has paused because leasing can't stop in the office space because leases are always expiring. What do you do if your lease expires at the end of the month? Are you gonna not renew your lease? Are you not gonna renew it in two months? You have to do something. So what we're seeing is some short-term extension to get through this period. But for major new leasing decisions, most of those have been put on pause, not because people don't want to transact, because many people can't transact. They can't transact because they can't physically see the space. And that lack of ability to physically see the space is impacting the capital markets as well, as you can't do due diligence. And of course, it's impacting construction even more so, where many people are not even permitted on their own job sites, which have come to almost a complete, complete halt uh, in certain cities like Boston uh, being among them. Now, notwithstanding the short-term pause, let me tell you a little bit about the long-term for a moment in two ways. One, the math of rent, and second, the secular argument that many people are making today about the future of office. So let me just give you the math first. And uh, Tip O'Neill, your great Speaker of the House uh, in uh, Boston, uh, had a great quote talking about, uh, you're entitled uh, to your own uh, opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And so math is facts. This is what actually happened. And then I will give you opinion afterwards. So what actually happened in both the global financial crisis and the post 9-11 period, it took about two years for rents to go from peak to trough, and then about six years for rents to get back to their prior peak in the office sector. Now values bounced back faster. They bounced back in about four years because the capital markets uh, conditions improved in terms of a lower cost of capital, but it was two years peak to trough, six years peak to peak. Now the question is, is that what's gonna happen Today, are we going to wait six years? And as the large occupiers on this call say, oh, you know what? I'm going to wait two years to sign my because Spencer said it's going to be two years till we get peak to trough. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is those were what those comps said. The other comps that I'm looking at include the other comps I mentioned earlier in this call, where if you take a look at the SARS period in Asia back in 2003, it bounced back much faster after about a year. Six months, things got about to normal, then about a year, things got back to really normal there. What you're seeing in China today, where large industries are largely running as normal. The smaller businesses, not so much, but large businesses, yes. So those are two comps that had much more rapid bounce backs than we had today. Now, again, I am open to all comment and criticism that those aren't the best comps, but let me give you one more comp, and this goes right to the secular argument I've been uh, hit with now almost on a daily basis about are people going to use office less because everybody's working from home right now, including me. And the comp I use for that is Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy in 2011 devastated lower Manhattan and to cause material damage to a lot of office buildings. And why did it cause a lot of damage? Because a lot of these office buildings had their critical infrastructure, HVAC and other building systems that were below the floodplain, below the waterline. What happened after Sandy? Buildings became more resilient. They started putting their critical infrastructure above the waterline in these flood zones. What else happened? Buildings became more resilient in other ways. We did studies of buildings in Mexico City after their earthquake three years ago. Almost no damage to the Class A office buildings because they became more resilient following the prior storm. So what's gonna happen to office today? It's gonna become more resilient, like it always has. And how is it gonna become more resilient? Well, for those of the folks in this call in the healthcare business, you'll know that there is a difference between a traditional office building and a medical office building. A medical office building has a higher level of redundancy, resilience, to use the word that I've been using, both with respect to electric and HVAC. They need to have a sterile environment in their operating rooms because that's how operating rooms are. We will see more office buildings get closer to that standard of cleanliness, which will give people more confidence to go back into the office space. When I say more confidence to go back into the office space, I'm gonna be black and white on this, folks. People are gonna go back into the office space. I'm going back into the office space. I'm going back to restaurants. Why? Let's be clear. Office space for most people isn't a need. 
It is a want. It's the same thing with retail. It is not a need. It is a want. And that has been the case for a very long time. And office space will evolve that people want to be there. And why would somebody want to be in the office? Well, they'll be happier. They'll be more productive. You can attract them and you can retain them. That is what every single survey I've seen over the last 10 years has shown. That's not going to change. What might change is some of these resiliency factors as it relates to the cleanliness of the space, as it relates to densification, which I know each and every one of you corporate property folks on this call are thinking about. What is the average square foot for my average employee? Maybe that pendulum begins to swing back. So yes, the workspace is going to become more fluid. And by the way, CBRE came out with a report about a month ago called the 2030 report, which I'm delighted to send to each and every one of you following this call. And what's in that report? The fluid workspace and how it was going to accelerate over the next 10 years anyways. And what is the fluid workspace? It's not just working from your home or from Starbucks. It could be working in the back of a self-driving car, but you're still going to want to go to the office because it makes you better. You're still going to want to go to the restaurants because it makes you happier. These things are not going to change and we are in the heat of the moment right now. Once we get past the heat of the moment, I think this pent up demand will accelerate trends getting back to normal-er, but not completely normal because there will be some of these secular changes in how we design office space, maybe how we design restaurants, but they will bounce back faster than most people think. And so with that, that's my overview of what's happening macro and micro. And I'd be delighted to take any questions you might have. So I guess I'm passing this to Stephen or Katie. Please uh, let me know what we got in the chat room. Yep. Hi, this is Kate. We've got a couple questions so far, but just as a reminder, if you have additional questions, please submit them through the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, we'll start reading them from there. So um, the first question here, <clears throat> excuse me, from Jackie Fala is, can you talk about the flat recovery, dropping down and not coming back up because of companies that were overvalued? Sure. So I think uh, the, the term I would use, thank you for your question, Jackie, is what's the shape of the recovery? Is it V? Is it U? Well, let me tell you, uh, I'll give you one other shape, uh, which is a shape that my global chief economist, Richard Barkham, uses. He says a Nike shaped, and forgive me, forgive me if anybody's there from Adidas, has nothing to do with the sports brand. It has to do with the shape of the recovery about that slower sloping shape. So to, to the question, I want to be very clear that we expect a V-shaped economic recovery, we expect a Nike-shaped real estate recovery. It's going to take longer. And that longer recovery is not quite the flat recovery uh, that was suggested by uh, uh, Jackie, but it is going to be much more of a laggard behind the, um, uh, the overall economic recovery. Uh, but to her question about company being overvalued, uh, well, look, value is a function of two things. It doesn't matter if you're it's a real estate company or an airline. It's a, it's a function of the expected future revenues and the cost of capital. And what we're suggesting is that from a top line basis, from a macro basis, we're expecting those top line revenues to get back to normal faster than most people think. Probably in about a year and 18 months to get close to baseline in those revenues. But not every company is going to be that way. It's going to be uh, certain companies are never coming back, as I suggested, the 20% of the restaurants that may never uh, come back. Um, and so uh, what a lot of our large landlords are doing right now is they're not focusing on uh, many of our good clients and occupiers that are on this call, which are typically at large companies. They're focusing on the smaller ones because the large companies will be resilient, much more resilient than the smaller ones, but it's the smaller ones that may go out and never come back. And those are the ones that need the attention right now. Next question, please. Great. So the next question is from Amanda Ribeiro. With all of the uncertainty, should we be concerned that more people will demand the flexibility to work from home? This would in turn decrease the square footage of real estate that we would need. Sure. So, um, and I, 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 it, that was Amanda who gave that question. Um, yep. uh, Number one, Amanda, you're getting my report uh, right after this call on the 2030, which has this section on the fluid workplace, which we had anticipated prior to COVID-19 
being a major trend over the next 10 years anyways. Has it accelerated that trend? To some degree it has, but I think there are two things here. There's always a pendulum. I always talk about a pendulum or yin and yang. Those are my two favorite uh, concepts I like to use. But the pendulum is this. Demand for office space changes depending upon not just the fashion of the day or what the experts on productivity believe is the most productive way for people to work together. Now, the people have been working together in bullpen type environments for decades. I was in an investment bank in the early 2000s and the CEO sat in the bullpen right with us. Just, just like Mike Bloomberg sits in a bullpen at his office in New York City. He likes that, right? He feels he's more productive. He thinks it's better. So it's not new, but the tech companies were really the ones that drove that new office design of what we call agile workplace of the, of the large open areas and then the quiet areas uh, for conference rooms. But let's go back, Amanda, to what I suggested a moment ago regarding resilience. And resilience isn't just going to be the building systems. It's going to be the square footage for the average employee. So on that densification pendulum, which keeps getting tighter and tighter and tighter, less and less square foot per person, that is likely to swing back now. So yes, we might lose some people to more flex work, more working outside the office, but we might make it up again in more square footage for the average employee. So net net, it's, I think it's impossible to say today there's going to be less demand for office space, A, because of that densification pendulum swinging back. And number, number two, going right back to what I said before, every survey we've done says that people are better off in an office than not overall, and that's not going to change. Next question, please. Okay, this question comes from Chris Horblitz. This pandemic will change a number of factors and considerations of risk. Can this, will this happen again? And what will that do for CRE values for real estate, et cetera? Will there be another pandemic? Yes. Will it be like this one? No. I think we've learned our lesson on resilience. And after this, there will be a day of reckoning on how we can protect ourselves long term so this cataclysm doesn't happen again. And so the ways that we're going to change are going to be both subtle and uh, not so subtle. The not so subtle changes are going to be at airports. And the airlines uh, are now going to have to test each passenger in a similar fashion that they test you for metal objects for disease that may slow down airport lines in the short term as they figure this thing out but eventually i expect it to be just as efficient as it is today and then by the way you say oh that sounds like a draconian step well that's what they do in south korea today they do that in south korea today and that's part of the reason why south korea is bouncing back much faster than we are from this terrible crisis it's testing that is the key why is testing the key because if you can test you can take a more targeted, more rifle shot approach to targeting the problem rather than the shotgun that hits everybody approach that we have today. And testing in places like the airlines is going to be one of the overt changes you're going to see. You're also going to see the changes in office design uh, that I said before. But in terms of the other forms of resilience, uh, which is in terms of having hospital beds, ventilators, uh, and uh, reserve doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers, that's going to change too. So I would expect the uh, horrible situation that we're seeing right now in New York City um, uh, is going to be remedied long-term by something along the lines of dealing with those three factors, the hospitals, beds, doctors, testing, uh, in a much more organized fashion, much more prepared fashion, hopefully much more like South Korea, hopefully much more like Germany, the two areas that have the lowest mortality rates, and it's no coincidence. It's because they were able to test, they were able to segregate those most vulnerable, and they're gonna win. So yes, this is gonna happen again, but we're gonna be a lot more prepared. Next question. The next question is from Steve Schneider. What is your opinion of the government bailout as it relates to corporate real estate? How will CRE benefit, if at all? Well, let me start big picture. I don't think most people understand just how much money $4 trillion is. I mean, I'll tell you what, I, it's, it's almost an unimaginable amount of money. But let me give it to you just how much it really is. So you take the most pessimistic forecast for the second quarter GDP, 
And I believe Morgan Stanley's at negative 34% or Goldman Sachs is at that number actually. That's negative eight and a half percent GDP on an annualized basis. Okay, a lot of money. Four trillion dollars is 20% of GDP on an annual, 20% uh, total. 8%, 20%. More than double the amount of this horrible quarter has been pumped into the system right now, which is never happened that fast, never happened that large. And by the way, there's more coming. So how will it benefit corporate real estate? It will benefit corporate real estate, number one, by giving a cushion to people who spend who for on consumables, uh, not just in unemployment, but also thousand dollar checks that are going to be coming out in a week or so. All of this is going to help in the short term. Uh, in the long term, these SBA loans are going to help as well, keeping small businesses alive that are going to also not just be consumers for large businesses, but also potential merger candidates over the long term, keeping our econo economy vibrant with innovation and, and, and other things. So number one, from a macro basis, they shot what is known as the bazooka uh, bigger than it's ever been shot before. And, and, uh, and the reason why they did it so quickly and with such force this time isn't just from lessons learned in the past several crises. It's a, there's also a moral reason behind this. And you hate to talk about economics and morality and philosophy. It sounds almost um, philosophical. But the point is this. Unlike the global financial crisis, there were no obvious bad actors here. The banks didn't do anything wrong. Um, there's no villain here. And in the absence of a villain, people can come together quickly with this rapid amount of rescue dollars, A, for the, call it the Main Street economy, which will then uh, help the uh, corporate economy. The corporate economy is being helped directly in certain ways, in certain industries that are most impacted, like airlines, uh, like hotels. And we are actively lobbying groups with groups like the Real Estate Roundtable and the ICSC and the Mortgage Bankers Association to expand that to all types of real estate owners and occupiers that are most impacted. So the, the, the amount of capital coming in is staggering and it will uh, accelerate the economy much more quickly than people think, which is how it's going to be big corporate users uh, the most. But I'm gonna give everybody a little, not a nudge or a warning shot, just a, a reality check. We have a presidential election coming up in November. And I had, a, I had a, uh, a very serious conversation with my global chief economist yesterday. And we both agreed that uh, we should, if it was possible, we should delay the presidential election by six months. And why is that? Because I don't want any economic or medical decisions to be made through a political prism, zero. I want them to be made in the best interest of Americans, period irrespective of the political outcomes. Unfortunately, once we get to July or August, when we're still gonna be in the midst of this crisis, albeit not as dire as we are right now, people are gonna start looking at aid through a political lens. I don't want that. I want it to be purely on the best interest of Americans. And unfortunately, that's why I'm suggesting to all of my corporate and uh, other folks that are lobbying these industry organizations uh, to get as much aid as you can as fast as you can, because come August, September, it's going to be a completely uh, different uh, political environment. Now, I, I would say that not as a black and white matter. Uh, I remember in the 2008 uh, post-collapse of Lehman, that was right in the midst of the presidential campaign. Uh, the country came together then, uh, but we came together sooner now, and maybe that's a good thing, but I still fear the, uh, the ramifications of a presidential campaign clouding what might be uh, the right thing to do over the long, uh, at least in that period of time. Next question, please. Okay, so these next two questions are somewhat related. Um, Doug Berry asks, can you talk a little bit about the airline and travel industry in general? And then Sarah Abrams asks, uh, she has a view that passengers won't be putting up with the same packed in like sardines anymore in an airplane. Will we see the same issues as uh, densification in office? Well, um, Sarah, is a, is a, uh, thank you for your question. Sarah is a friend of mine, and I'm delighted she asked the question and, and the other question as well. Uh, I'm going to ask for Sarah's first, and I'm going to go back to the other one. Um, the airlines don't have a very good reputation by, by 
consumers, not only for being packed in like sardines, it's the charging for the luggage, it's for the hundred other things that everybody in this call knows about. Uh, what's going to happen now because of this bailout, these are going to become quasi federal actors for some time. And actually there was an article about that in the Wall Street Journal this morning, the op-ed page, talking about be careful what you wish for, because if they get a bailout, they're essentially going to be, become federally uh, chartered uh, institutions and subject to a lot of the whim of, of the feds, which is yet another reason why I'm in a completely different context, uh, people um, are uh, suggesting that if you don't need to take a bailout from Fannie and Freddie, don't take it because it puts you underneath their um, supervision to some degree and be careful what you wish for. You don't necessarily want to be supervised uh, by a government agency. But yes, Sarah, to your point, it goes right back to the argument I've made a hundred times and now I'm making it 101. We have become too efficient and that efficiency broke us. If there's a villain here, the villain is efficiency. And the efficiency villain not only got us too close together, it broke our supply lines, it didn't give us enough storage capacity for our food. And so do I see the pendulum swinging back on airline seats? I'm not gonna say black and white, absolutely yes. I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna say to some degree, maybe. And I say maybe because if we take out, let's say, just for sake of discussion, 50% of the middle seats, so there's more seats have, have space. Airline costs are gonna go up. Your ticket to go from Boston to Fort Lauderdale, Florida is gonna go up by 200 bucks each way because the, air, because the cost of gasoline, while it might be cheap now, won't be cheap forever. And pilots and other salaries are gonna go up. So you as a consumer, if you're prepared to accept higher prices, then I'm prepared to accept more space. But there are some airlines like Southwest that I understand may not take a federal bailout because they may not need it because they're much better capitalized than some of the other big ones and they're packed in there. And I love Southwest and I'll get right back into the packed in seat. So I think there may be some of that, sir. I don't see the pendulum swinging far back because you're gonna see a massive increase in prices. And by the way, I'll go to the same place on the cruise ship industry. I know everybody here is lining up to go on a cruise right now to the Caribbean, but the they're going to come back too. You know why? Cruises are awesome. I've gone on a lot of cruises. They're a lot of fun. And if they price it at zero, there's a lot of people that are going to go on a cruise ship again, and they're going to go raise prices more and more and more to people get back on it. So I think the secular argument you're making, Sarah, is exactly the right one. But we just need to think practically how far that pendulum is going to swing back. So great question, Sarah. And Kate, forgive me, the question just prior to Sarah's. It was uh, broadly, can you talk about the airline and travel industry in general? So I think you touched a little bit on that. But Sure. So I, I gave you the, the, the pendulum on densification. I'm not going to give you the, the industry in, in general. They're coming back. And in about two years, they'll be back to where they were before. That's the short answer. The long answer is right now, it is rough. I just got off the phone with uh, my global head of hospitality research, Jamie Lane. And Jamie said that they just downgraded their hotel forecast for the U.S. for 2020. Uh, borderline apocalypse, down 45% for the year. And he believes that the second quarter is going to be down by over uh, 65%, just a horrible forecast. But they will come back. And in fact, there's some segments of hotel that are not falling off a cliff, which are those uh, lower ends of hotels that that house essential workers today. And by the way, Airbnb, while it's struggling in certain major markets, is actually doing quite well now in secondary markets where people are going there, some to flee the virus in major cities. So they will bounce back in about two years. The major hotel companies uh, have gone into pure defense mode. They'll survive. And I think in about two years, you'll see that industry uh, in very good shape uh, from a top line perspective. Uh, albeit there will be some casualties for weaker operators uh, who need rescue capital today. Next question, Kitty. Um, so this question comes from Denise PA. Please speak more directly about the effect on construction prices during the recovery period. Sure. So I've talked about that extensively with developers all over the world. 
uh, give you a couple of stories. One is I've been speaking to my affiliate, the Trammell Crow Companies, and I had a, a very good conversation on Monday with the largest condominium developer in Canada. And the short answer is this, is that notwithstanding the downward pressure on wages because of unemployment, not a lot of that's going to trickle into the construction area. While some of it for base laborers are going to get cheaper, it's not going to happen in the skilled trades. Because if you go back to the global financial crisis, skilled trades actually got more expensive during that period because a lot of skilled trades companies went out of business. You might see some of that here today too. So labor being the number one cost item in construction is likely to be neutral. Maybe even higher, but neutral is probably a fair assumption. As it relates to materials and land costs, that's a more nuanced answer. So in the land cost, when speaking to my developer a client up in Canada, they're saying that the, that fully entitled land in a CBD location in Toronto, those values will not drop. Now, people might delay putting a shovel into the ground, but the values of the underlying entitled land will not drop. Now, once you go further out on the entitlement process, those values might drop and they will drop. I don't know if they're gonna fall off a cliff, but they're gonna drop because what you've done is you've delayed the period of time when people are prepared to put that shovel in the ground because fundamentals are uncertain at the uh, moment. As far as materials go, an interesting thing about construction materials, because I studied construction materials uh, at some depth a few years ago, and, and that was a period of time where we had a drop in the price of oil, which we thought would then translate into a drop in the price of certain construction materials that are dependent on oil, like asphalt, or a drop in the price of steel. The reality was quite a bit different because most of those materials, notwithstanding the global commodity prices, are sourced locally, and those prices can be uh, dependent very heavily on local supply and demand. So you take a market like Boston that has a tremendous amount of new development going on there. They're not likely to see a material drop in those input prices, but a smaller market that it's much thinly, much more thinly um, being constructed today might see more of a drop. So long fancy way of saying, I see construction prices as relatively neutral at the moment for the overall building. But here's the area that's most important, I believe, to the uh, Cornet people on this call. What's gonna happen to tenant improvement allowances? Because tenant improvement allowances, which is a probably the more practical amount of construction costs that people are thinking about, has many of the same inputs. It has labor, it has materials, and it's dependent in part on uh, the location of, of the property, but really the materials and labor cost. But what you now have, what has just happened? What is, what did I just say about resilience? Are our large corporate occupiers gonna say, gee, we're now gonna need to put in an advanced HVAC system, not only into the building, but into my space. That's expensive. Now, what's been really expensive for all of our corporate occupiers over the last few years, what's really been driving costs up the most is technology, is wiring, is raised floors, so you can put it all underneath. Now is it going to get even more expensive? And then, and then here's the real question. Who pays for that? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be the landlord? Is it going to be somebody else? Right? And that's where it comes in. And that's why you might see some downward pressure on rents, not only because of the um, fall off in demand that's likely to exist for uh, 18 months, 18 to 24 months, but also because of the, geez, this space is going to cost me a lot more to build to get up to that higher cleanliness standard. I don't know that space will get to the cleanliness standard of a surgical center and a medical office building, but I am certain that space's cleanliness standards are going to rise materially and that will add cost as well. Next question, please. Great, the next question is from Sandy Duciardi. On the entrepreneurial side, which industries, uh, even outside of CRE, do you see having tremendous growth, such as telemedicine? Well, uh, this is this is tele-economics. How's it going? Uh, so look, telemedicine was coming in uh, before, and uh, that trend really started probably 10, 12 years ago, maybe longer, uh, with respect to x-ray technicians. X-ray technicians uh, were able to um, read, uh, you, you get an x-ray in Boston, somebody was reading it in India or Tel Aviv or another city. Uh, so that's been around for a while. What, what you're now saying in telemedicine is that going to expand. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I think that the uh, need for that has been around for a long time. I mean, look, uh, if you take a look at the cost of, of drugs, 
uh, uh, I mean, pharmaceutical drugs, uh, not illegal drugs. Um, part of the reason why they're so expensive isn't just the cost of development. It's also, it's hard to get them. And you've got to go through this whole system designed not only from the doctors, but to the health insurance. It's this inefficient system that is uh, a big culprit in the, in the rise of the cost of drugs. And so I think because of that factor, in addition to this remoteness factor, yes, telemedicine is one of those areas. And, and by the way, just a, as a general statement, uh, and I was just on a call with a large German investor just prior to this, we're very bullish still on the tech space overall. And if you take a look at the publicly traded REIT prices, you'll see that not only have industrial prices bounced back to par from where they were a few weeks ago, but uh, data centers and um, cell tower REITs have also uh, largely bounced back too because uh, the tech industry is going to do well, not only in terms of entrepreneurial folks, uh, but it's also going to do well for office space demand overall. So uh, l let me hit Boston with a, a bad fact and then a good fact. Okay. This is, you know, I'm coming here with love folks and I'm coming here with my Dunkin Donuts coffee, which is my last bastion of normalcy in my life right now. But here's, here's my truth and love section for Boston. The three cities in America that have historically been the most volatile from a rent perspective are San Francisco, Austin, and Boston. Okay. There, I just hit you in the face, but now I'm going to come right back to you. But that was really after the tech bubble of 2001. Which cities are going to be more resilient today because tech is going to do so well? San Francisco, Austin, and Boston, because we think the tech industry is going to be most resilient. It's going to lead to a lot of spin-off businesses, not just in the tech area, but also law firms, accounting firms. And to the caller's question, many smaller, innovative startup firms that can feed off of the virtuous cycle that Boston has uh, better than anybody. The number one tech brain drain city in America, meaning they, they, you create too much tech talent in Boston, which is why you built the seaport there. Uh, it's going to be Boston's um, uh, not so secret weapon to really thrive through this crisis when other cities are going to suffer. Next question, please. Great. So I think we have uh, time for two more questions, Spencer. The next one is from Doug Berry with the boom in commercial construction value and escalating real estate lease rates. Will this construction boom continue and will lease rates continue to escalate due to the need to, uh, for industrial and manufacturing and warehousing space? So I, I heard the construction boom, will that continue? What was the other part of the question? Uh, will the construction continue and will lease rates continue to escalate due to the need for ah, industrial space like warehousing? And yes. Manufacturing? Okay. Well, industrial is probably equal, if not more, the most resilient asset type in this crisis. At the same time, industrial is not immune to this crisis. And you, we've already seen softness in net absorption uh, in industrial, particularly in port areas that are most impacted by uh, international trade. Um, small bay industrial uh, that has smaller contractors also seeing softness uh, through the weakness in those businesses. And they're gonna have some rent collection issues there uh, as well. Uh, but to the caller's question, um, the short answer is that you're going to see some short-term softness in industrial, uh, but not to the same degree you're going to see it in retail, not to the same degree you're going to see it in other areas. Uh, and in fact, it's going to be more resilient even than, than office, though you will see some short-term drop. Uh, and you're still going to see new construction. I think new construction may slow just a touch in the short term, but over the long term, it's going to get back to trend very quickly because all of the mega trends that matter to industrial from e-commerce to last mile to the reshoring of manufacturing, all point, and the resilience factor, I probably said it now uh, 14 times on this call, I'm now saying it 15, the resilience factor requires more industrial space. Uh, and I'll make the fourth factor is the modernization of industrial facilities uh, augurs for more industrial space, not just horizontally, but vertically being able to build these taller buildings because of modern racking systems that allow you to have uh, a taller building with the same footprint. Next question, please. Okay, and for our last question today from Suzanne Cooper, with so many remote working now, what are you hearing about cybersecurity considerations and the impact to internet infrastructure? Well, it's gonna get a whole lot better soon, but I will tell you that I'm also part of the broker dealer here uh, at CBRE, and we've gotten plenty of emails about how we have to be super careful, just like every other person who is in a regulated industry has to be super careful because cyber crooks are every and they're going to exploit weakness. And right now we 
have proven we're at a point of weakness because we were not resilient enough, not only in terms of our physical infrastructure, but in terms of our technical infrastructure. So the bad news is it's a problem right now, but much like the question of three or four questions ago, the next time we're gonna be a whole lot more resilient. And I hope that leads to a boom uh, even more in technology and 5G, but other forms of security, uh, which could help spur the economy as well. Back to you, Katie. Great, thank you. So we're, we're just a couple minutes before the hour. Um, any closing remarks, Spencer, that you wanna provide to the attendees today? Well, I'm gonna tell everybody a funny story. For people who know me on this call, I travel more than anybody. And I've been called the Johnny Cash of real estate because tr I've been everywhere, man. I've been home now for a month. And at 10 o'clock at night, three weeks ago when we were in the belly of the beast, my 10-year-old daughter walked in and I put on a song on the radio from early 1980s music, which is my vintage, and we danced for an hour and a half. It may have been the best hour and a half I've had in a long, long time. So I hope that notwithstanding the fact that people are suffering today, professionally and personally, there are some silver linings out there, and I hope you find the time to enjoy them. Great. That's it, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time today, Spencer. And thank you everyone for joining uh, this first edition of the Crave series at Cornet New England. That's going to be a wrap for today. And we will um, send out the recording and be posting it on our website for anyone who wants to share it with their colleagues or for anyone that missed today's presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. Go Boston and Cornet. <laughs>